You're listening to Pop, The History Makers, with me, Steve Blame. This is an immense pleasure because you have been, well, you've produced so many tracks that have been part of my, I'm going to say upbringing, but I was well into my 20s by then, so I can't <laughs> pretend I'm, I'm that young. Um, right. I want to start with your early upbringing and yeah. um, really sort of find out whether you were in a musical family or what type of family were you in? Were they creative in any way, your parents? My parents, uh, my father uh, was, he he was in the RAF, but he, he was the entertainments manager based in Salon. Uh, apart from other things and he had a band in the in in salon called the blue eagles which i you know i have a picture of so my father we have we had a piano in the house uh you know when i after i was born a long time ago and uh yeah we had a piano in the house and and incredibly enough we had a hammond organ with a leslie in the house which is fantastic I started playing drums and my mother played piano as well but none of them um professionally and i started playing drums around the age of 11 and was constantly tinkering around to be honest with you but so there was a lot of music in the house yeah definitely what about you you've got a revox uh player very early didn't you yes i did and and if you look into my uh up there wherever it is or the other way around you can see that's a, an a77 uh, mark three yeah i got a, the original uh g36 uh valve which was if you think it was about 1967, these were like 150 pounds, and that was a lot of money then. But the, the the magic of it is you could track bounce, you know. So I basically would. Um, this is how I learned to about multi tracking, recording myself, you know, having been influenced obviously by the Beatles and everything else. Um, you know, I'd lay the drums down, then I'd lay the Hammond down, and I'd get on my knees and thump thump the Hammond bass pedals because it was easier, and and it was. A learning curve on that and then a bit later on um when i had some money i invested in a you know the the tiac the old early four track which enabled you to you know multi-track and, and it was you know expanding all the time yeah going back to the first one you got how old were you then because i remember my parents brought me you know like a it was only like a small cassette with a microphone yes and i remember introducing records and then hard cutting the yeah. songs on cassette to make it out like I'm a DJ so and I was about 11 or 12 back then I just wondered how old you were I, I was um we, we had an early what's called an Elizabethan tape recorder in the house you know that would just record but you, you all you could do was record you know um um I would have been uh the, the day to the Revox I would have been a 17 18 and and basically in the period of the time I would I was just you know fascinated and had a little group and everything you know so although your parents were creative did they sort of put any weight in terms of a creative life because many parents say you know well do that in your private time but don't, it's yeah. not a career totally I, I mean the, the, my my parents are amazing they're, they're not here sadly anymore um and my father was a a, a printer actually you know he after the war he, he got into to that color printing on polythene and, and then had a factory um, in byfleet he i mean to be honest with you and my mum was a you know a housewife and to be honest with you i think he would have liked me to have gone into business but he also loved the fact that i was doing music but actually what happened is that um uh, you know i i wasn't getting anywhere and it was it was very tough and uh, i ended up uh, because straight out of school, I, after my A-levels, I went to the BBC and then shortly after um, uh, got a job at ATV, not as a sound guy, but as a cameraman, because I thought sound and television was a bit tedious. So um, but all that time uh, we were recording or doing things in in, in some manner or form, you know, so um, um, and my father, he 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 was all very worried. I remember him saying when I left um ATV, which is a very well-paid job. You know, I, I was getting well-paid, had a mortgage. I was in my 20s. Um, he, he said, you know, are you doing the right thing? And and, and are you you doing this? And then everything else. But he, he really, uh, you know, as soon as things started to go well and everything else, because it, it didn't go well initially. It was extremely hard to make actual living out of the music business. And um, I, I worked as an engineer in the studio at 26. I'd, I'd started to make tea again after having a great job. 
Um, but the one thing that touched me is that, uh, you know, my father in his car and, uh, you know, later on when, we, when he died, you know, in his car were all my cassettes, you know, the, the imagination records, everything, you know, and, and he, he, he really, he, he really liked it. So, um, there you go. So. I mean, that's interesting you say that because actually you, you, you just mentioned uh, imagination and I'll connect a story from Lee, uh, yeah. um, Lee John. The about great Lee. That as well. <laughs> yeah. And he, he talked about his father who he, he didn't really have a close relationship, but when his father died and he went through all his stuff in St. Lucia, yeah. um, he found a box of clippings of yeah. his life, which yeah. was a totally sort of moving um story and i yeah. had a really sort of uh dysfunctional relationship with my father i mean he left when i was very young yes. um but when he died and he was on his deathbed he you know he sort of he told me that he'd always loved me which was something that he'd never done before right and, wow and and i think we're from that sort of generation yeah where yeah. it's sort of an, where we didn't really speak to our parents like oh. people do today was totally. that the same in your household yeah, I think this is. I call it the the ladybird book generation. Mum's doing the ironing. It's a, it's a typical dad goes out to work, and my father was working a lot, and he used to come in, but he he you know wore a suit all the time, and he you know he he, he wasn't. My mother was completely opposite. He wasn't. A, 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 he was a lovely man, but not not tactile because of that generation. It was all you know. I go to work and I come in and and everything else. But yeah, and it's funny how little you know about your parents until later on. And he, yeah, it was, um, it's interesting, but he, I know he was, he was proud of me at his funeral. Somebody came up to me and said, oh yes, oh, you're, you're, he was called Cyril, you know, he, you're Cyril's son. And he said, yeah, he considered you his best friend. I mean, you know, when you find out at your own father's funeral that your dad thought that I was his best friend, so that you know that's quite incredible, really. But yeah, but the, but um, uh, interesting. If if uh, is this a very interesting conversation? Not works, but interesting psychologically. If that drives you uh, towards uh, wanting uh, success or or you know all all those things, but but I was just determined. Uh, I was just so fascinated with with the music business. My grandfather. I have to say it must be in the genes going way back in my family my my one of my great 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 ancestors was a famous clockmaker and scientist and uh, an inventor and and so my grandfather made radiograms and and uh, you know on the side so it, it it's all um it it's it's all in you and i was just fascinated by the whole recording process and and, and everything that went with it you know so i mean you mentioned drive and and how that important is and also where that comes from because I always believe when I, I've interviewed so many uh pop stars yeah. in my life and done so much research on them that I, yeah. I've always sort of seemed to find out there is a childhood wound and I think we all have childhood wounds in a way however big or small they are they're yeah. there and they're the things that sort of drive us the other thing that we have is when we're teenagers we hook on to an artist often for me it was David Bowie because I was yeah. a young teenager in the early 70s and of yes. course, Bowie came along. And for me, he not only his music, but he represented a world where I could feel my or be myself and get away from yes. my parents' world. Did you have a hero in your teenage years that represented in a way where you wanted to go? Oh, yes. Well, um, I think in my T, it has to be the 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 it has to be the Beatles and the and the the just the recording process and how they turned. I mean, I listen to them still, and if you listen to the early albums and you know their first single, which wasn't a hit, and I remember seeing them on television perform it live, "Love Me Do," and um, I mean it's a minor hit, but the whole thing about this sort of recording an album in two days with the band and everything else. Um, a change to them using uh, a four track machine as a, a creative instrument. And I think, I think it's interesting because I, I, I have this conversation with colleagues now that because we're creative people and, you know, I songwrite as well as produce and play uh, is that we have a sort of, it's not that we're, you know, better or from a, another planet or anything else. We 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 don't feel we think the same as other people, and and you know, we, we're sort of conforming to things and and routines is is quite difficult. And I think that this is um, 
you know, the the sort of the regimentation of early childhood, school, and um, the whole thing that was going on in the fifties and sixties, and and outside, you know, then there was this, you know, like these albums were coming out with all this noise and 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 you know hippiness and and everything else, and it was just like, wow, this is this is this is where I belong. I don't I don't belong here. I, I I wasn't put on this planet, although I did work. You know, I worked for my father on the bands and saved up for my first Philips cassette recorder, which I've recently restored. Can you believe? Um, but um, uh, yes, I think it. And it, I think it's a driving driving thing. I, I've been, you know, I went to some nice schools, not private, but it, I didn't I didn't love it. And I I you know sort of uh, doing exams I hated it all and, and everything else you know I, I just wanted to be creative and, and carry on you know do that sort of thing have you always listened to music differently from other people do you think I, I I'll be honest with you uh because of the exposure to it in my childhood where my parents would go and see My Fair Lady or you know the the music, or or Russ Conway would be number one, you know, with Side Saddle or something like that. I I think I was exposed to a lot of um, easy listening stuff, you know, uh, whether it be you know Mantovani, what have you, or or on early jazz, you know. Um, one of my fa our, our my father, mother and father's friends, the the father, I went round to their house, um, and and their daughter was we were at school together, and he had a uh, you know, a record deck with a leak amplifier built into a cabinet, which I thought was fantastic. But he played Oscar Peterson and and I was exposed to jazz there. And I thought, you know, I really love this. This is fantastic. Um, so, yeah, it was very much, uh, you know, an absorption of everything because the and, and that certainly it certainly got into me because even in in people have asked me about this in body talk at the end of it, there's some really sad strings that go you know da -da, like this da -da. and that is without a doubt the you know sort of early exposure to Michel Legrand sort of you know that type of thing because I think that you know it's to all these genres creep into everything you know it, it doesn't matter what you what you say you, you people tag it oh it's R&B or it's hip-hop or it's you know jazz but it's yeah it's a fusion of everything yeah I mean you mentioned you you went First of all, to the BBC, then you were at uh, ATV, and I presume that's where you were cameraman on the Muppets. It is, yes, yeah. it was. Yeah, what, with, what, with Jim Henson, who was uh, the, the boss of the Muppets. What, what first of all, what, I mean, you know, I mean, everyone knows the Muppets. Obviously, yes. they've been around for centuries. It feels like. So, what was it like working on the Muppets? Was that just a job and and something that you really weren't that keen on, or was it something that you had some passion for? We it was one of the best eight years of my my life. The, the the people I worked with were just incredible. I'm friends still with a lot of them. Unfortunately, some of them passed away. But um, the it was unbelievable. We'd never um, you, the people think the Muppets were shot in America, and they weren't. They were shot in Elstree in in ATV Studios. There, the first thing we did, and we were doing a lot of us shows for America because we were working in color in dual standard PAL and NTSC way before the BBC. So, you know, Tom Jones was delivered in colour. We were doing all these specials and all these American artists would come over. It was, it was fantastic. But the first thing we did was Julie Andrews and Sesame Street. And um, uh, they built Sesame Street in, in the studio. So we went, oh, wow, look at this. Because satellite it, it, at that time, in the late, there was no satellite in the UK, you know, or, or anything really. So we weren't exposed that much to um, uh, American... Uh, exported uh, TV programs and um, so they built the set and, and we did all this stuff and, and then we, we, we'd we never seen anything like it firstly, the first thing we saw is that the Americans would build a, with the, the, the puppet or Muppet stages uh, three, four foot in the air so they could not crouch down like everybody was doing in the UK and the other, and the, um, the other thing is they'd use on the Big Bird and stuff like that, they had radio links and monitors inside the costumes so they could see what they were doing. But the, the Muppet guys were just unbelievable. I mean, uh, you know, there's Jim Henson, Frank Oz, who went on to direct lots of things, and and they were just lovely people. And 
um, absolutely brilliant at what they did. I mean, we would laugh. I, I'd find it difficult not to laugh because when you're holding a camera, you can't laugh because you just, you know, shake up and down. Some of the stuff we did was just hilarious. And of course, the, there's the outtakes of, um, there are some outtakes, God knows what happened to them, of of um, uh, Fozzie Bear and, uh, no, sorry, Kermit and Miss Piggy after the cameras started stop rolling. I won't get any further than that, but they, I think they've been buried somewhere. So, um, but they were, yeah, it was a, it was a, a special time and a, and a great sort of honor. My, my, you know, at the time my parents came and visited, I have a picture of my mother and myself with Kermit and Miss Piggy, you know, the real, and um, yeah, it, it was a great time, but it was, it was work and it was hard work because, you know, you, you, you're standing in the studios all day and, and everything else. I mean, I, I saw Alice Cooper, Peter Sellers, uh, John Wayne. Um, we saw, um, uh, Oh, Glenn Campbell, Gene Kelly did Singing in the Rain. And um, you know, my, one of my, my claims to fame is I was I was there when uh, we shot um, David Bowie and Bing Crosby doing um, uh, that the duet that they did. Um, and, the Christmas uh, song, wasn't it? The Christmas the, yeah. and seeing, seeing Bing sing Last Christmas. Yeah, for, it was Little first... Drummer Boy, wasn't it? What they That's said? right, yeah, yeah, yes, it was for the for the last time. And he died three weeks later. So, you know, and... and some of these stuff is is happening like making records you you know that they're, they're it's a it's a, a it's a long process to make an album and uh you know you've got a track that you keep revisiting and and sort of you know go back anyway so yeah i'll come on to I, that I, in a second yeah. i just want to talk about because working in that that environment that's where you met steve jolly wasn't it in... correct yes yeah. steve was a <laughs> so sound guy yeah what what connected you because there, you know, to work together later on, there must have been a connection between you. So, what connected you? Was it was it music? Was it just working there? What was it? Well, it was a it, it, we we formed a band called Chaser, uh, and Steve we, we knew was a singer, and he he was in the sound department. So we we and Brian Grant, who was also a cameraman, and Brian later, you know, went on to direct Olivia Newton John's Physical, Whitney Houston's, you know, you got a dance, Duran Duran things, and everything else. And he was the drummer in the band. And, then, and we got, um, when we were all working at ATV, we got signed to Polydor uh, on, a, on a record contract. And, and even last week, someone sent, I've never seen it before, somebody sent me a picture of the session in, in Polydor that we did. And you just go, oh my God. And there's a, it was filmed. I've got the, the sound uh, of the film, but not the film. But, the, you know, we can't find it anywhere. Um, I was listening yes, to the, one of the tracks, that Red Rum. That's it. Oh, Which is you're on, very brave, Steve. You're very you brave. To <laughs> well, I was going to say to you, and I mean this in a polite and nice way. It yes. didn't. It didn't really musically have any of the promise which was later no. to come. <laughs> no, certainly not. Um, and uh, but it was the story of that, as you brought it up, is that um, uh, Peter Sainz produced that, who did had produced "Your Lady" by Peter Skellum, and it was our. It, it was like. The, the the excitement of going into a, a studio um a, a, like a you know we were going into a, a 16 track studio into Polydoro which was in Stratford Street and where Jimi Hendrix they showed us the Jimi Hendrix multi tracks and uh the uh, you, you know the now used syringes for oiling the machines you know so, so they were in a in a sort of like um uh, how can i put it an altar to sort of jimmy in, in there but so it, it was just terrifically an exciting time for us and we'd written this track and there was a few connections and, and polydor so yeah let's go with it and then i thought i'd had a heart attack because the the horse lost the race and polydor were in force at aintree with t-shirts and and as soon as in the the horse was going to win the race they were just going to open the coats with with the record on radio one had banned it as a sports record believe it or not, but we're playing it on trailers. So it was selling actually. And then it just, that was it. So, so we did some further recordings, but in the end, it, I think it's when Wayne Bickerton, who later on, you know, became a friend, um, was head of A&R, but he was like, we used to get chucked out for the Rubettes, you know, of the studio. Um, and, uh, you know, they just said, 
what are we going to do with them? You know, so they just dropped us, you know, as, as they do. So that was the end of our pollen tour career. So. Most people in their lives have um, a mentor who, who you know, who brings uh, things to them, techniques into what what it, what their future will be, and so so on and so forth. Was there was there one in your life, someone that actually was able to bring you the idea of what production is, or bring the idea of sound, and so on and so forth? Well, I think that. If you imagine that the Red Bus studio, Red Bus is where I, I went to initially, was being built by Tom Hidley, who was a famous studio builder. Called, and he, he did a studio called Eastlake, all beautiful, all shag bar carpets, you know, rocks everywhere, like a sort of the, um, the you know, very American looking. But they, the, the, this was a state of the art studio and was to become, you know, very important later on. So I, I'd taken the plunge and, and gone, I'm going, this is what I want to do. I left ATV and I just thought, I can't, I'm, I'm going to be honest with myself and I'm going to give it a go. But of course, I had experience, I had musical experience and I, I knew how to, you know, I had a bit of studio experience and multi-track. But when you're faced with a, a full-on studio and the techniques and the outboard gear and all the microphones and the orchestras, etc., there's a lot to learn really about, you know, doing this. So um, I, I just, it was very difficult for me because I'd been in an environment where, you know, I had a lot of friends and it was a fantastic time to seeing a studio constructed, you know, with builders. And basically I'd gone down the ladder to the T-boy. So um, and I was the assistant. But Jeff, a, a guy called Jeff Calver, who had produced the Walker Brothers and Lindsay DePaul and was a fantastic engineer. He he really. Um, helped me a lot by teaching me what you do and what you don't do, you know, with with compressors and reverb and and gates and microphones and, and where do you think you stick a microphone on the flute? Well, you know, you stick it above in the air and think what is the correct way? What microphones do you use on viola uh, violas rather than violins and cellos and trumpets and saxophones and this stuff? So I ended up learning a lot from him and then I would engineer and I could get great drum sounds because I was a drummer so I'd, I'd be working with Barry Blue um, or any great uh, producers that were that were around and I'd be sitting there going after a while of years of doing this and it was hard hard work because it was like day and night you know I was exhausted um, and we'd use dead time to record and I, after watching them I thought I can do this, you know. I, I I know what to do now. I know how to get these sounds and everything else. So I taught the owners into, um, and we were signed to them as producers, writers at the time, and everything else. I taught them. I said, look, I don't want to do this anymore. Tomorrow, I want to be known as a record producer, and that's all I want to do. So, and they said, okay. And at the time, uh, Trident Studios had headhunted me. And said, you know, because I, I was getting work because of the sounds I could get and everything else. And it's, uh, and I, I went to talk to them and they said, well, we're going to pay you, I don't know, some ludicrous amount of money, way more than you're getting now. And I, I just thought, yeah, OK, well, I'll be engineering what Elton John, Queen, whatever. And, and um, but I will not be able to go into the production, use the dead time and the other stuff. And I, and I made the decision. I went, no, I'm not going to do that. I'm just going to try and survive here on two thirds less salary than I was getting at ATV. And 12 weeks later, they went down. Trying. So that was a lucky escape. So, um, uh, th so that was it. That was a transition. So it was a case of, and I think the problem today, it's not a problem uh, because I admire a lot of the work that's being done today. Uh, I mean, there's, you know, in the, all being done on laptops and the processing and everything else. But that grounding of actually, you know, some people, have, some guys today have had massive hits. They've never, they've never seen a real trumpet. You know, they've never mic'd up a real trumpet. And it's, it's to understand how these things interact with, with other outboard gear, like limiters and compressors and reverb. And actually reverb is a, an extremely important part of making records. And if you misuse it, it can be disastrous. You know? So um, things like that. So just, I mean, these are sorry. Go on. Oh, well, just I just want to go back to Jeff Calver, um, yes. of uh, who worked with the the Walker Brothers, yes. um, because you mentioned he said to you there is a right way of 
miking, I think it was a trombone or something on instrument. Or a flute or anything. Sorry, yeah, yeah. yeah, of miking something and a, and a wrong way. But I know whenever you're learning something, you need rules. <laughs> yes. You know what I mean? And actually yes. by breaking the rules is you create something different. So yes. when was the point that you reached that you broke the rules rather than went by the rules? Ah, uh, well... I think you need to that that's a very good point Steve because you what I'm saying is you need to know how to to do it properly before you can start to create yourself and break the rules and uh, once you know what this equipment can do and its capabilities then you can start to push it and you can push it because we, in the early days when we were there was no CDs and we were making um vine you know for vinyl there were parameters you had to stick to otherwise when you went to the cutting room the cutting engineer would say well the bass is making the the cut bounce you know you can't put things like that extreme left and right or the hi hats breaking up the cutting head you know so there were issues like that, that and it was very important that you went to the cutting room to to learn about what the parameters were of the vinyl. And, and so I did that as well. But your question, yeah, very interesting. I think I started to, um, it all started to come together because we were doing this dead time recording and everything else. And uh, uh, that's when, well, Body Talk was created um, at that time, but was part of something else. And uh, I, I sort of thought, well, if you wind the compressor up a bit, the, the, you know, the bass drum really sounds, you know, really wacky. And and if you do this and if you put, I'd listen to the, your earlier question, because I've listened to a lot of American things, even like Tony Bennett, right? You know, I left my heart in San Francisco. The, there's this enormous splashback reverb, you know, it's like, it's almost like, and I, I thought, how do they do this? Well, this is, they just, what they do is they think, use a thing called pre-delay or tape going into the reverb unit. So they delay the sound going to the reverb, which is what I used later on in the Spandau True. You know, that's what that is. It's his voice being splashed back through the reverb. So I started to push the parameters and, you know, the, the, we had a harmonizer, which was an early digital pitch changing thing, you know, and it was very expensive. Everything was expensive. An AMS uh, delay unit that would capture, uh, you know, a clap or something, one sound that was like we, we had to figure, you know, they, these things were 10 to 15,000, you know, just for one unit. Um, and I, but I started then to get creative and go, okay, you can do this, you can do that, you can push this and we can wind these things up and, change the sound of that within the limits and then it's funny because then i uh, we, things started to happen and you know everything else and there were some great people working around colin thurston was producing the early duran records in red bus uh, martin russian was doing human league in there and we were all chatting and going and, and colin would go in he'd come in and go oh, Simon LeBon was staying with Colin because Colin was trying to help Simon develop as a singer and everything else. And, and he came, Colin came into me and, and he said, what, what do you, what, what do I do about this? And how can I create an artificial double track? And, and what, any ideas? And we'd just converse and go, do this, try that, you know, put, put the harmonizer on it, speed the machine up and down, do, you know, we had no auto tune for a long, long time. Um, uh, and I'm not saying Simon needs auto tune, but, but the, um, and so basically we were all uh, talking to each other about what bits of new gear could do, uh, how you did this and, 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 and that sort of thing. Yeah. I mean, that's amazing because Martin Rush and Colin Thurston and yourself, I mean, three of the, the, the major producers of that era that you're talking about who actually yeah. dominated the charts and you always, well, I'm saying you always, I always have this imagination of, of, of there being some competition, people being wary of like, they've created a new sound that may be like something really successful. So I don't want so-and-so to have it, but the uh, way you're describing it is a much more sort of open thing where yeah. you're able to communicate to each other. Was there a security in, in the sense you're working with a specific artist. I'm asking this in terms of you thinking about them as well, working mm. with a specific artist and knowing what was good for them 
and that so that didn't really matter you couldn't really pass that over because it wouldn't sound the same with Spandau as it would with um um Duran Duran as it would with the Human League yeah you you'd get a situation especially um uh, uh, with the sound that we were, you know, the bass sound, which was a, the, the thing I played uh, on, on the Imagination Records and, and created that sound. And and we, we then used it maybe on a Bananarama record. And um, you, you'd get it sometimes from the artists. They'd go, you know, they'd hear the record and they go, oh, it sounds like sounds like one of our sounds or it sounds like... So, yes, it was. And, and, and funny enough, Cruel Summer was a track that we had and I... Not not that he's made a mistake, but I offered it. You know, we offered it to Lee, and he said I can't see it really. But the, but it wasn't in any state as it what ended up. You know, there's a story story to that track as well. So. All right. Well, I'm going to come on to Banana Rum a bit later. Yeah. So let's start with the artists because you know, imagination is where it really took off. Can yes. you remember meeting Lee John? Um, and what your impression was of him, you know, the first time you met him. Steve, no one can ever forget when they meet Lee John. This is for sure. That's all I can say. He is, I'm going to say this because we're still friends and and uh, uh, good friends and, uh, you know, have helped each other. He's an amazing, he's an amazing singer and an amazing person and and one of the hardest work working people I've ever met. And he, you know, incredible. And when I met him, you know, his character was just like larger in life. And and this whole situation before Body Talk um was I think they'd worked, they'd made a track with Trevor Horn, who who I remember meeting Trevor, who came in with his shoulder bag and you know, we, we had a quick chat and everything else. And the, the, the this is an incredibly classic story. So they, I can't remember the title, but he, they'd made the track and then sent it to America, the multi-track, for remixing, and it never came back. So so that was a problem. And then Morgan Khan, uh, you know, was then, uh, he was sort of involved with Red Bus. Uh, he, they, they sort of did a co-deal on a thing, an R&B deal for the R&B label. And um, what happened is that I had already had body we had body talk as an instrumental track um and uh and uh, the the thing is at the time that that had different bass and everything else and then i started to to work on it um uh it was it was basically an instrumental that went you know da -da 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 -da, with the piano and i just you know there was something about it everyone was going why aren't you using slap bass on it you know why? Why? What is that synth base on it? Why? Why are you doing that? You know why are you doing things that are different? Or why is it so slow? You know, so and I said, I'd, I'd listen to Rise by Herb Alpert, which was you know it, it, I could tell what was happening over there, and I thought you know no, this sounds great slow. You know, it, and it's it, it came together because of the hand claps and everything else. Anyway, uh, to cut the long story short. Um, the I had that on a cassette and took it home and it nothing was happening to it. It was going to be the the what's this uh, John Curry what Tony Anthony Curry skating theme or something. I don't know what was happening, and it was just like every it, I went into the living room. I could see the cassette on the shelf and it was like it was just like going do something with me. Um, and um, anyway, I took it back in and then. Uh, Morgan, I think, or, or one of the guys there, sent uh, gave it to Lee, and they worked on a, a lyric for it. And then it was one of those, okay, these guys, you know. So I meet Lee, is going, you know, darling, you know, everything else, and you know, I thought, okay, great, let's try this. Um, and we literally did it in a day, uh, half a day. We put the the body tour, the vocals on, and then um, the it was recorded in its long format. All the imagination thing uh, tracks were recorded uh, long, uh, six minutes and everything else. And uh, so not cut into 12s from singles, which is a whole different, you know, ballpark thing. 
the so so we put the put the vocals on it and everything else and we thought yeah it sounds sounds great it's, you know fantastic and the thing and then I sat with um uh Morgan Khan uh, and we mix you know he it was great I mixed it but he 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 was very helpful because he was going to the clubs all the time and he was going the bass let's let's you know you get the bass at the right level and you go as you would mix a record and then you go yeah let's go higher so so it's like okay this sounds great and it sounds right but no let's push it higher and we did so it was featured on the thing and because the, the bass and the claps were the you know the the big thing about it and the the, the, if you saw how the claps were done, myself and my engineer, Richard Nengel, was, you know, sitting at the desk with a microphone hanging over the top, just going like for hours, you know, you know like this, ourselves and tracking it up because there wasn't an efficient clap sampler at the time. And everything, there was no, there was no sequencing, no computers used in any of those early records, not even just Illusion. It was just hard graft trying to keep in time. Um so, and we used the Lin drum uh, a bit later on. So, so, when do you know to stop the risk? Because obviously, risk is an important factor to to push the push the boundaries to to increase the bass sound until it's like you know an oddity, like you sort of mentioned before, something which is yes. unusual. When do you know when to stop and say, okay, this is ready? I'll be, I think if you, as a producer, it, it's funny because. I've always said to people in, in a studio, I, I can make decisions and, and direct everything. I know exactly where I'm going and what I want, you know, but if anyone asks me, you know, what color carpet do you think we should have? Forget it. You know, it's just like, <laughs> you know, it's just like that. I can't, I can't even think about it. But um, I think you, if you're not, if, if it's doing nothing for you as a producer, if you're not sitting there going, oh my God, this sounds fantastic and I've never heard anything like it. Or if you play the mix back and you just go, it's, it's a bit boring, isn't it? And the thing is, I had to develop myself because I'd played uh, on that particular record, um, uh, Graham Jarvis, who's no longer sadly with us, a great drummer had drummed on it. And I played everything else on it myself. So you get to the point there where you you're sitting at a desk and you went oh that that overdub there took three days this this bass took two days whatever and you're going actually it's rubbish and and get getting rid of it you've got to be that harsh with what your own work and i think that the and, and until you you're blown away yourself and also it's important to take it home um you know listen to a mix in a, in a, a normal environment the car the house and everything else or on, and on small speakers i mean uh, because if it doesn't blow you away on in every environment uh, you know obviously a club it will blow you away because there's the volume that's that's when you know you just you just know but you don't you don't know whether things are going to be hits or not you you really don't it doesn't matter what anybody says i've i've revisited tracks where someone's asked me to do an edit or something after they've been a big hit and the, the, it's like you get the tape out and it's got sparkles on it you know it's just like it's been blessed you know I, I can't explain it but there's no way you just I mean true when, when they uh, the first time we worked with Spandau was with Lifeline and then they asked us to do the True album and then uh, when we got round to True as a single I, I, I was in shock I just said are you serious? That's six minutes long and it's a ballad, you know, I mean, radio, but, you know, so I did more work on it, but anyway. Did you try and cut that down, True? Because, it, you know, I think it was five and a half to six minutes, I think. Somewhere. It was over was six it, minutes. I was cut it over a minute, six minutes? Yeah. A minute wow. out of it. But the, the, oh. just, uh, the, the worst cut down I ever did, which was really difficult, was Just Illusion, because that was five to six minutes that had to be cut to three. So you, you trim, you do this, and then you have to put sometimes overhang pieces that that you know you do a cut but it cuts something else you have to redo an instrument or move it or yeah it was very hard and this was physical tape cutting as well razor blading it you know well so, where do you where do you have to stand back from self-belief and ego and compromise with with an artist oh dear well are you talking about myself or the artist? Well, so, both ways. I mean, it's obviously from both sides. Otherwise, you're never going to get anything come out. <laughs> well, I think that you just you you have a you have a feeling about 
what works and what doesn't work. And there are formulas and, and formulas when they've been successful are difficult to break. So you, then you get criticised for making the same record. record. Uh, I, you know, the, the review of Just an Illusion, I mean, I, you know, the reviews are fantastic of your records because it just, and you, and you just look back and go, you know, whatever, that's what you thought. The, the two reviews I remember, one was on Just Illusion, which said more hand clapping drivel from Swain and Jolly. And um, <laughs> and, and, and the, the review of the Alison Moye Alf album, which, you know, we had was very successful, said like listening to Soup in the Basket. How did so, that make you feel? <laughs> well, I just not great. But the thing is, it's like, you know, you just go... OK, let's let's keep our fingers crossed. You know, the proof's in the pudding, isn't it? And the thing is, is it's like film critics, you know, um, having just seen Babylon, I'm quite shocked at, at the film critics' opinion of it, you know, um, the, that it's what they think. And actually, the public are completely different. I mean, it, it's funny because the night dubbing album, which was the... Uh, I didn't want to do it, you know, but the, the record company said, look, you know, and it was um, uh, it was an early uh, remix album, you know, using new techniques, everything else. And it was hard work because we'd done that. we had done the 12 inches, the edits. Well, they've been hits. We we're going to dig this all out and revisit it. And I went, oh, no, nobody was doing that at that time. You know, it was 1983 or something. But we all I remember is we just hired every piece of gear we could get our hands on, anything that was new anything that does anything crazy. And we just went nuts. And I have to say that, you know, we finished it and I went, okay, we'll put it out. And I was shocked. That album went in at like number nine. And I knew something was right. Cause I remember in the summer going into a car park in a field and it was some event. And, and then I was wait, sitting waiting. And then I, I, I was over there in another car, I could hear the album night dubbing. And I went, there you go. So you, 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 you sometimes you, what I'm saying to you is you don't, you think you know and you don't know yourself, you know, so you can't always predict anything. Otherwise, we'll be having hits nonstop, you know, so. I mean, uh, Imagination were, were hugely successful. And I'm just wondering how that changed your life then. Oh, wow. Uh, yes, it did. And like all things, when you start a career, you can have success, as in the charts, but the money, you know, the money doesn't come till sometime afterwards. Um, not that that was the issue, because it was never never about that. Anybody doing music never goes into the business for money, that's for sure. Um, but uh, uh, it did change, yeah. Because but suddenly, did you become it, suddenly in? You know, everyone wanted to work with you. Yes. Every, it was Didn't Madonna crazy. want to work with you as well? Yes, yeah. Uh, I mean, the, the, the when we did it, Imagination, Bananarama, what happened is that the, the Imagination were, were dominating the dance and pop charts. This was the key that, that set everybody going, hold on a minute. These are pop dance records and they, they're going into all charts, you know. So that's when it was that point, I think, particularly with uh, especially Just an Illusion. Um, is that the, the, then we had Spandau wanted to work with us and Bananarama uh, initially and, and, and all sorts of things. And, and Madonna was she absolutely loved imagination, and uh, so so we were. I was, you know, she wanted to work with us, but it was a time aspect because we were getting we were so busy, you know, we were so busy, and we never said no to her. I just just said we we can't do it until August, but she was phoning me every day in the studio, literally saying, you know, when are you going to come? When and I met, you know, we we had a meeting with her manager, our managers at the time after she did Top of the Pops Holiday, we met her at 11, 12, and she played her demos and everything else. Um, and Seymour Stein, who was the head of Sire Records at the time, he said, um, I met him later, because obviously she did the Steinberg and Kelly track, uh, um, Like a Virgin, which what broke her, you know, as a huge pop artist. And um, I don't think that, uh, no disrespect to her, to her at all, she's an amazing artist. I don't think we would have lasted more than three records, to be honest with you, because she loves to move on and she's very clever. She goes, they're the best. I want them, you know, whether it's William Orbit or anybody else. She's very smart. So I think she just thought these guys are getting huge hits, pop and dance. I want to work with them. Uh, and so so that's what happened. So it, it was. Yeah. But I went later on. I said to Seymour Stein, uh, 
uh, up to about four, three years later, I said, can you believe, Seymour, you know, that we didn't work with her in the end? He said, she, he said, so what? He said, you did the Alison Moyet album. That was great. So, you know. That's, you mentioned that's... Bananarama about working with them. Bananarama, yeah. I mean, I love Bananarama because they were, they they had this sort of appearance like, I mean, I, I knew them from the clubs in any case yes. at that point, but yeah. they were like regular girls, um, a lot of fun. Yeah. Um, but they were very much portrayed as not having a lot of talent, which yeah. I think has been seen differently over the years yeah. now um, at the time. What was it like working with them and what were they like? Well, it was an experience. What can I say? I mean, the, the thing is, we we wrote the first single. They, they weren't involved in that, which was we... we what happened is, is that we we wrote this the, this single, which was called Shy Boy, and the chorus. Um, it was Steve and I were working on the record, and we were in Red Bus Studios, and he it was originally called Big Red Motorbike. So the chorus didn't go uh, "Don't it make you feel good?" It went on your big red motorbike, and and I I turned to it. I said it didn't go down well. I said, Steve, this is just crap. You know, and he he we had, we had a bit of a row about that. And anyway, we then that was very creative. You know, we could have a row. Go, you're right. It is crap. So we got to, So we we said, let's do something Motownish. Don't it make you feel good? You know, dancing in the street. You know, that's what we did. So uh, we we got them in. They they you know they wanted to work with us because the imagination stuff and that was fine. And and, and we soon learned that the the best way to to record them was to get them to sing together. We tried individually miking them, that didn't work. And and it was just a, it was a sound that, what it was. I mean, it sounds a bit like the sixth form girls singing. You know, it's got a sound, you track it up and do a few harmonies, manipulate the backing vocals. But with, we put it up the desk and, uh, you know, there were lots of drums and percussion and stuff because we'd sort of, you know, really saying something had come before us. And we thought we, we have to sort of honour that, that, that sort of progression. But I put it up the desk and I just... And then I listened to really saying something. I thought, oh my God, you know, ours sounds so squeaky, clean and and nice. And even though it got the toms and stuff. So I literally went through the entire desk channel at the time, screwing in mid-range, you know, crunchy things, and then did a rough mix um that night. Uh I don't even think it was the right, you know, it's like not a master thing, so it was like seven and a half inches per second rough mix. And um and never bettered it. So the the rough mix of that night was what went out. So um and 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 that was that story. And then we we got working with them again. And I I, I mean I enjoyed working with them, but they had their own issues and you know things themselves and, and everything else. And but we yeah we, you know it was good. We we did a lot of work with them. You know four years of it and. Um, I mean, one of the tracks you worked on was Robert De Niro's Waiting, wasn't it? Yeah. Can you tell me a little bit about that? Well, yeah, and interesting, the video, Robert De Niro's Waiting, but John Travolta lookalikes in the video, you know. <laughs> and I've got the pictures. I, I, I don't know where someone, Sarah, or someone sent them to me, of the girls with Robert De Niro in the pub. I mean, Robert De Niro doesn't, he looks like startled, to be honest with you. <laughs> and, um, and look, one of the girls said to me, I think that Robert was quite keen on Karen, you know, and Karen said, well, if you think, you know, think of going out with him, that old, you know, whatever, you know. So um, uh, basically the, yeah, and we had this whole thing with the, uh, after we had this big hit with Shy Boy and we were working on Na Na Hey Hey, uh, you know, which was a cover, we'd recorded it. And then um, they, we just had a phone call saying, we don't want to work with you anymore. And we were just like stunned. So we went, okay. They went off and worked with Barry Blue, who did Cheers then, which, you know, was a went in at 40. And then he started fiddling around with Na Na Hey Hey, or they did. But fortunately, I'd made a tape copy of it, a, a multi track copy of it. And, um, and then we had a phone call, said, This is how this went. We want to meet you in the pub. So we all go to the pub, and it's like, it's not like normal sort of thing. They go, yeah, we want to work with you again. So we, we started working with you again, you know, them again. We we did no, no, hey, hey. And even when we went round to write songs, 
we'd knock on their door in the flats near Hoban. And uh, they'd open the door and they'd be watching television as if like we would just were in the neighbourhood and popped around <laughs> and said, we'd go in, they go, do you want toast? And we go, yeah, yeah, that'd be nice. It's just like, it was like that. But they are great. They're, they're, you know, they're, there's only one Badan Rama, I have to say. So, but uh, yeah, okay. To be fair on on um, on artists, I think not everyone knows exactly what they want. So that you no. can make today, you might go, oh well, actually, let, let's not work with them. Let's go this way. Let's do yeah. this. And then, if you don't exactly know where you're going or what you want to do, you can make different decisions. Is is it difficult to do you have to do you have to personally change to deal with a different artist's ego and needs and wants? Yeah, I think that you um sometimes you work with an artist and they're unknown and then they become very well known during your time working with them and that that can be difficult but we we you know or I, we didn't change. So if they were they were misbehaving we just ignore them, you know. So um the, the the thing with the I mean just skipping back to Banana Armour is that they, they were doing so much and they were they were getting more and more tired and we were running out of ideas because basically this fun band we were they were now writing lyrics about problems in Ireland and friends who had died and drug you know drug issues and it was like yeah okay this is not really you know what's happening and then we, they asked us to do Venus um, and we we just said you know we just can't do anymore you know we 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 we're, we're done with it and we can't offer you anything different and we don't want to do venus and of course that was a number one in america and pete waterman took over but i mean and pete's ish you know pete thinks he invented them and, and of course you know he didn't but no disrespect to pete but you know he he, he forgets there was a huge amount that went on i mean like fun boy 3 you know should take the credit for them really yeah. but you know it, but Every artist is different. And, and as a producer, um, and, and if you're recording vocals, you're not going to change the artist's vocal uh, abilities when they, they, they've they got a voice. And there's one thing you can do is make them feel, as long as they're prepared, make them feel relaxed, make them feel at home, uh, make them sure they've got the best headphone balance that they want. Um, because they get very wound up. It's very difficult, uh, you know, you know, pitching when you're recording vocals, you know, you take one earphone off or one door and it's, it's, you're trying to guide people. Um, and it can be very hard, you know, very hard. You do multiple takes of vocals and you get a word from there and a line from there and everything else. But it's That's not what easy. happened in true, wasn't it? With, with Tony Hadley, that, that you, you had to multiple record his voice and then do drop-ins. Yeah. Yeah, I mean that's the same with everybody. I mean that's not it's not unique to to Tony. Tony, I mean because it was a difficult difficult vocal, um, and and I I was working on the music. Steve recorded that vocal in Red Bus Studio uh, One, and all I remember we were waiting. You know, I said, look, you know, I've got all this thing to do, and you you've been at this for three to four days now, and and I, I said, have you finished? And he went. They came out as if they you know being down a pothole for eight days you know i mean they were exhausted but it, it doesn't matter because the end result is great you know so um it doesn't matter how you get that result it's it's like filmmaking i mean people think that filmmaking is a pleasure it's 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 very arduous you know but there are some artists that just walk into the studio you know like the, the famous story with tina turner yes. uh you know who walked into the studio with uh, martin ware and just you know recorded it he thought it was a practice yes <laughs> go through yes. and that was and for her that was it it was done you know yeah. it was, and it was well, you, do, you do i mean with um alison would she 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 was always eager to sort of finish and go home um and she's got a you know she's a fantastic singer and got has got a great voice and she could you know deliver it pretty quickly and uh, there's lots of soul sing you know that and Lee is 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 great. You you don't you know people can just deliver it and then you go well, let's do that a bit, let's do that a bit. But it's it can change. You know circumstances can can change and they can you know be difficult and and everything else. And also, it's what's going on in their life. You know if they've had a terrible journey to the studio, they can be very wound up. You know and and it's and and they just can't do it. And sometimes you have to make the decision. 
let's come back tomorrow and do it. You know, let's do it another time. So. Well, you know, working with Alison Moyer on that album, Alf, I mean, she made her name with Vince Clark in Yazoo with tracks like Don't Go, which is this sort of amazing sound and and had a sound that went with her voice. Now, as a solo artist, she needed to develop a, a new sound for herself, I presume, as well. Yeah. Um, how involved were you? Were there discussions about where she should place herself and how she should sound? Yeah, I mean, we went to, we had a meeting with Muff Winwood, um, and, uh, which was CBS at the time. And uh, he he was uh, for quite, at the time, Lamont Dozier had written Invisible for her. And, that, and Lamont Dozier had actually started recording Invisible, but it wasn't going how they wanted. And uh, so we went into this, this meeting um, uh, to, to, to discuss the whole thing. And and Muff was quite clear. He he saw it as sort of Dusty Springfield type, you know, thing, and, he, and not you know song driven, um, modern and everything else. But we the, the what happened is we started recording, and uh, um, you know, with Love Resurrection came out, and and that was you know reasonable hit about number twelve or something. And so the ball was rolling, and then we 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 were just recording in the studio. We were given a time sort of factor of January or February in the year when this was about September. And I I had a call, something Paul Young was recording, and that had gone wrong, something or it was delayed. And and we had a call saying um, from Muff going, we're going to need this album, uh, you know, before Christmas. And and we're going to need it in the next two weeks. Now we were we were well in recorded half the album. All cried out was a B side, and it was designated as a B side. And you know there was so much pressure on Alison and ourselves, to be honest with you. And um, uh, so, but we we pulled it together. And we got it out, and it was number one at Christmas. So you know what what it, it was fantastic. But it, it it caused a lot of pressure, and also. Uh, it, you know, I don't know what happened there. We could have made another album with her, but she she didn't like it. She didn't like the album. And and the story I've heard, whether it's true or not, she listened to it in her car on the cassette and that went straight out the window. I mean, incredible. Now she feels a bit better about it. I've talked, you know, I've talked to her since, but um, I think she, I don't know if she felt manipulated or what, or she wasn't what she wanted to do, because there was a period where she ended up doing things she didn't want to do, the jazz thing and Old Devil Called Love. She didn't want to do that. And then she made all these other albums and, and everything else. But, um, uh, and Rain, the point is our album sold the most and cost the least. And then uh, the, the Rain Dancing album, uh, which a friend of mine, Jess Bailey, who was a keyboard player in Spandau, he was in, involved with that. That was recorded in America. Um, you know, it was very expensive, but didn't sell as much. So, um, you know, you know, things happen. Um, but it's a regret. I, I, I wish we could have made another album with her, but, but we didn't, you know. Frankie Knuckles had uh, mentioned imagination, the sound of imagination as being very influen influential in the development of house music. Yeah. What, what do you, which is a legacy of what you've achieved as well, but what do you see as your legacy and what do you think your trademark sound was back in that era of the 80s? I think that, uh, I mean, it's incredible that, that you, you get into the habit of like, I always, I'm left-handed and that can make some influence in the way you mix, like with high frequencies, don't ask me why. Um, so a lot of our tracks would have, you know, hi-hat towards the right, which is where it would be if I was playing the drums, I'm left-handed. Cabasa on the left and and the bass, the, the 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 sound of that bass, you know, we used it on other records. Um, when we got to Alison Moye, uh, the technology, there was a Yamaha DX7, and we used that a lot. So we sort of tended to drop some of those sounds. Um, but yes, I guess the bass. And and I and I've been told that the the um I think burning up was the beginning of house or the piano, you know, the dun 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 dun, which I played. But I'll be honest with you, I couldn't keep it up. So we tape looped it. You know, we put it on a loop with the bass drum because I just said, I can't keep this up without a computer and, and uh, to be spot on. So, it, yeah, it, it was a tape loop. 
So, um, but that, 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 you know, the, the sort of uh, formation of those chords, which was sort of in the, and the intervals of those chords were, were the, probably the very earliest use of that type of piano as a, as a house track, you know, so my what, claim to fame. Yeah. But why <laughs> do people, why do people love um, that era of the eighties? They say it seems to uh, be so many people that love that era. Why was it so special? What is it about it? I, I it's I've been asked it, it's interesting because the eighties people love the eighties and I said well for me I was in a, a room with no windows during most of the eighties you know making these records um, and like you know when we went to the Bahamas to record the true album it was like taking a school trip with with the you know we were the headmasters and and the group and the roadies and everything else and in, we stayed in Compass Point and the beautiful studios I barely saw any of it. You know, it was it was because the studio had no windows. But but the, you asked me the question, what was it? I, I have to say, the, the technology played a big part. Uh, the 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 sampling, uh, different synthesizers, uh, the, the recording techniques were improving. The machines were improving. We were getting the be, beginning of the eighties. We had no, we, there was no, you know, the Fairlight was sort of in Clavier early, but there was no great sampling. We we had nothing at the beginning of the eighties and everything at the end of the eighties. You know, you couldn't get a, a, a you had to use a real piano if you wanted to play the piano. But then, you know, then we used piano samples. Uh, but in real answer to your question, I, and I thought about this myself as as why that is. It's the songs, and and the songs. If you listen to um, some of the the disco hits of the eighties, you know, coming in from America, whether it's Cool and the Gang or I mean, Earth, Wind and Fire. My God, September, you know, is still an incredible track, and it's just, you know, it, it's just sound and the songs combined. And and I think with the imagination stuff, that's that's what we did, and we wrapped it, it a pop track in a dance track, you know. And I, I think I think that's it. And I don't think. You know, there are some good songs around, but they're few and far between now. And the genres, you know, the the sort of age group, there's no record shops and there's all the media is being dumped in charity shops and, and it's like disposed of as if it's worthless. Um, and I think that um, it's just changed so much. But, I, and, and, but what's interesting is the radio is still playing my records, which I'm very grateful and flattered about. And, and they, they, there's a, so that means there's a hunger for this music still and and these songs but if i wrote a song now that was like something i'd write in the 80s you know the record company go well, what do you expect us to do with that it's like it has to be old to get played it's peculiar you know well tony swain thank you so much and i want to again say what i said in the, the beginning because you've made such a massive contribution to pop culture and created some of the most beautiful songs of an era that was very important to me and I'm sure to many other people. So thank you. Well, Steve, it's been great, great to talk to you. And uh, I've really enjoyed it. So um, thank you. And uh, yeah, see you soon. <laughs> Up there is an interview I recommend. Down there is where you can find all the podcast interviews. And here is where you can connect. <laughs>